Oh, great. So today is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Um, Taj uh, Frazier and Ben Caldwell, if I pronounce your name correctly, right. uh, to UNH. Uh, so let, let me first introduce Ben and Taj. Uh, so more people coming in, <laughs> multitasking, trying to admit them. Wow. <laughs> so Ben uh, Caldwell is a Los Angeles-based uh, arts educator and independent filmmaker. Uh, he's a native of New Mexico uh, and studied filmmaking at UCLA. Um, uh, Coldwell's work has been uh, showing nationally and internationally, uh, most recently at the Los Angeles Municipal Art uh, and at the Tate Modern. Uh, so Coldwell uh, founded the Chaos Network Community Art Center in Lamarck, uh, Lamarck Park, LA. Um, uh, which is a community art tech accelerator center uh, dedicated to providing training on digital arts, uh, media arts, and multimedia at the heart of uh, the Lamarck uh, Park, uh, which is a historic center of the Los Angeles jazz culture, uh, now actually hosting a diverse uh, multi-ethnic multimedia art center. So uh, Tasha and Ben will talk more about uh, this exciting um, place. And uh, Dr. Robinson Tash Frazier uh, is a writer and professor of communication in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California and also a director of uh, the school's Institute for Diversity and Empowerment. I should also add that he's a great mentor of mine at grad school and well beyond that. Um, so his research explores uh, Black and Afro-diasporic uh, political and popular cultures um, in the U.S. and also elsewhere, uh, with a specific focus on histories and current day dynamics of race, racism, masculinity, cross-cultural contact, and fellowship, and also urban media and artistic practice. Um, so he is the author of this fantastic book. I highly recommend if anyone is interested, uh, his uh, monograph, The East is Black, A Cold War China in uh, the Black Radical Imagination, which was published by uh, Duke University Press in 2014. Um, and uh, he's also a producer of the documentary film, It's Yours, a story about hip, hip, hip hop and the internet, uh, which was uh, uh, made, uh, produced in 2019. Uh, so for today's presentation, uh, Tash and Ben will talk about their uh, forthcoming collaborative book called Chaos Theory, uh, the Afro uh, Cosmic Arc of Ben uh, Caldwell, which would be published by the Andrew City Press in for, uh, fall 2013, uh, 23, uh, so very soon. The book combines narrative history with multimedia and archival materials to explore the community engaged art, uh, media and art, and art practices of uh, filmmaker Ben Caldwell and also a uh, LA based media arts lab he established in uh, well, well back in 1984, uh, which is uh, called Chaos Network. Um, their presentation today will highlight several of the media and artistic works featured in the book. Very excited about it, as well as the detailed aspects of uh, their five year uh, long research, uh, collaborative research on this uh, book, their travels together, and also their collaborations on other um, projects. So, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Ben and Tash. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to be with you all, um, you know, through these devices. I wish we could be in person. And uh, I look forward, hopefully, to the next time we'll be in person with all of you. I also want to give, uh, you know, just again, express my gratitude um, to all of you, Nora, and others who helped to coordinate this series of, of discussions. Um, big, big gratitude to Len. Len is not simply a colleague, but a friend, um, a collaborator. Uh, I want to actually express my gratitude to Lynn for, for arranging, coordinating this, being so persistent in terms of making sure it happened. I also actually want to also express gratitude to all of you for really looking after her um, in her transition to, you know, academic professorial life. Um, you know, we were, I was happy to see her go because it's always great to see 
you know, grad students get through the program complete and transition. But it was also pretty sad to see her go because she was and is a person who helped make Los Angeles home for me. So I'm just appreciative to you all for um, really taking her into your community and really, you know, empowering her to lead. Um, so yeah, again, thanks again. Um, so what we're going to do today is a, a mixture, I guess, of presentation and, and, and discussion of some images and, and talking, Ben talking about his background. So it'll be a bit back and forth. Uh, we've done this usually in person. So this is, I think, our first time Ben doing this um, via Zoom. Um, so, you know, we look forward to the discussion that will follow. Um, so Ben, I'm going to share my screen. That work, Ben? Okay. Okay. You want to say anything to start it too, Ben? No, it's a pleasure to, pleasure to communicate with you guys. It's excellent. Let's see. All right. Um, all right, can everybody see this okay? You know, it's always interesting when you're never really sure what what those of you on that side can can see. Can you all see the screen? See everything? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna go back. So, it's going too forward. So again, uh, Ben and I are here to discuss uh, this five year collaboration we've been on, um, which uh, really has culminated with this book project that'll be coming out next year, this book multimedia project called Chaos Theory, the Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell. Um, and I guess to begin, I thought it'd be good for Ben to give you all a bit of background just in terms of both about himself, but also about just Chaos Network. We'll get more into detail about, about Ben's work in life, but I wanted to, we actually wanted to just kind of transport you all, um, you know, wherever you are in, you know, uh, New Hampshire or any place else. I'm actually in Cleveland right now um, to transport you all to to Lamert Park, Los Angeles, um, to 4343 Lamert Boulevard, um, home of Chaos Network. Ben, you want to talk yeah. a little bit about Chaos Network? The thing that you're looking at right now, I'm not liking the echo. thing that you're looking at right now is out in front of Chaos Network. It's, it really gives you an act. Hello? Yeah, man, we can, we can hear you. The echo, okay. way, we just, but now it's like the, we're seeing your shoulder. I think you're using your phone. There. Now, right. see now I've got, yeah. Yeah, I have the two, the two on here. So that, oh, I see. That's good. So, yeah. Perfect. So, the. Perfect. All right. Now it's good. Great. Yeah. All right. The thing that you're seeing out in front, this is one of the typical nights that I started developing in Lamert Park. Uh, I saw that really what was needed was uh, uh, a real engagement with the youth. And part of that engagement was after school. So, I set up a program to engage all the arts around. Um, uh, Lamert Park, which was an area that they call South Central. And in that area, I opened up my place to all the high schools and colleges to uh, do whatever was needed in the arts forms uh, with them. And at that time, it was hip hop. Uh, so that was in 1984. After teaching at Howard, I saw that um, real clear focused time needed to be done about uh, the way that media uh, ties in and controls the viewpoint and the outlooks of, of uh, Black Americans a lot and, uh, and everybody in general. But I thought I would really focus on the African American culture of which I'm a part of it. And then uh, to open up a space to then uh, study and I called it an incubator when I first started this video, 3333. Um, we, we started it after uh, a Olympic project that I did here for eight weeks, uh, interconnecting five disparate communities. 
uh, doing something that we call teleconferencing or that you guys are now called Zooming, which we're doing here. So I started my place out in 1984 doing this, this type of thing as a time capsule uh, for forward studies and use. So is that enough? That's great. That's great, Ben. We, um, and as Ben said, you know, he established this space in 1984 in Lemur Park. Uh, Le Park is a community located in South Central Los Angeles, or what's now called South Los Angeles. It's in the northern part of South LA. Uh, it's a community that really serves as a, a kind of nexus between um, LA's kind of economic elite and its working class and low income communities. Uh, Lemur Park, uh, Lemur Park Village specifically where Ben's space is located as you see on this, these two kind of, adjacent, these two these two maps, Chaos Network as you see on the, the map on the right is located in the kind of, uh, kind of central east kind of quadrant just north of Lemur Park Plaza. Um, but this is a, a kind of central business hub of the neighborhood where you can find bookstores, coffee shops, uh, clothing stores, uh, beauty supply, restaurants, um, gathering spaces. Um, this is a, a space that really since the 1960s has been one of the kind of black cultural hubs of Los Angeles. It's been a site where a number of really prestigious, important cultural spaces um, were founded in the aftermath of the 1965 Watts uprisings. Um, and Ben began working in this space as a filmmaker artist in the mid to late 1970s. And by the 1980s, as he says, decides to open up um, a media incubator community arts lab um, in this neighborhood. Ben, I was going to ask you, what makes Lemert Park such a unique place in space? Now, I was going to say the part of what you're describing uh, is like if you really look at those two blocks, which is really probably three blocks total or even four if you include Crenshaw, that little circle of property there had, had the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick makers really all in that one space. Uh, 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 so that was what was unique. And I think that's what I'm um, uh, thinking is gonna happen in the future as we uh, uh, get our places together after the Metro comes. Also, it was, uh, within one week, I got to meet uh, about about two or three artists that ended up being um, um, MacArthur Grant recipients, you know, Genius Awards meters. Uh, we also, uh, it was really Art Central for, Lemur for South Central. Um, and that's really what I liked about it, because along those host strips, we had a lot of artists who were living in the studios at that time. Right. Ooh, sorry. Ben and I, it's interesting how we met. We actually met through a colleague of mine, uh, Francois Barr, who in the early 2010s partnered with Ben and several grad students on a kind of creative technological endeavor um, that came to be called the Lemert Park Phone Company. Um, ben, can you give a little bit of background about the Lemert Park Phone Company, about this endeavor? Yeah, the Lemert Phone Company, uh, Lemert Park Phones Company came out of um, really hacking that phone. Uh, it was out in front of my studio and I uh, approached Francois on the idea of repurposing the phone uh, because I, of the work that I had been doing with, um, uh, with Electronic Cafe. Uh, we still kept our projects going from 1984 on. Uh, the team that worked there, we constantly stayed in touch. And then, uh, at, uh, and then I expanded the program with CalArts uh, where we had 10 sites that I ran and interconnected uh, all our main art cultural communities. And I organized them 
with the idea of the four directions. And that four directions is meant that it was to have black, Asian, white, and native people interconnecting, which is also called Latinx. So I call uh, native people really uh, their, uh, their Latin heritage. And so I included those four uh, directions and we interconnected them using uh, media. And so when I saw that phone booth and I saw that they were dying, I then thought, actually, these guys have all the elements that are needed to do research. Uh, and so why throw out all the ideas of a 21st century object out with the dishwater when there are so many things in it? So we hacked it. And my life hasn't been the same since. Uh, we were able to really, uh, I showed that to a group of students that came from um, uh, the uh, Art School of Design. And uh, I got to meet Retro through Pamela Blackwell, who was one of the teachers there. And she introduced me to the idea of autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And so we thought, wow, so we could make the phone booth a, a sentinel like it was in the past, because it would be the first thing that you would come in. But let's see, what would make it really cool for the 21st century was to make it Wi-Fi accessible. So we then tore out the guts and we made all the buttons uh, up, up, uh, up. We updated it to what I would call an iPhone. It has the full capacities of an iPhone. Uh, and plus we pulled it off the wall and had it run off of solar energy. So we were able to discover with the uh, Lamert phone company, all those kinds of aspects with just this phone booth. And so that's what started us on, on the trail of really investigating uh, this. And it's really the way that I started working with almost everything that I do with this place is really investigate it as many different ways as possible. So it'd be helpful for the community that I'm living in here and for the rest of the world once we're able to ship it around. Right. I mean, I remember being, um, you know, asked to participate in the Lemert Park Phone Company. So, what, so just a little bit of background about it. This is an endeavor that 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 Ben, you know, uh, uh, a filmmaker, community artist, and uh, a professor and grad students kind of initiate, and they had no real kind of. Their objective was how to bring people together to have serious conversations about the city, about. Um, um, inequities within Los Angeles and to come up with ideas about how to repurpose, how to hack the machine to bring communities in conversation and dialogue with each other. So every week we'd all meet, um, different folks would lead the conversations from AR and VR specialists to community artists, to activists, to organizers. Um, and it brought together the academic community as well as folks who live in the surrounding areas who were artists, who were educators, um, to have these kinds of conversations and then to come up with ideas about what to do with the, with this machinery. Um, and in the end, I mean, they created, or we created all of these different kinds of public artworks where you could listen to the music of people who grew up in the neighborhood via the devices, where you could push a button and hear oral histories um, through the devices. Uh, so the goal was in many ways using it as a tool and medium to bring different communities in conversation, but also as a point of, you know, sharing information among those who, who encountered uh, the pay phones. Um, and we'll also kind of reference the various ways that the same project has been taken up by other initiatives and in other collaborations um, in the aftermath of this, of this, this, this collaboration. But in any case, this is how Ben and I first met. I was an admirer of his work for some time one of the things that we didn't mention is that uh, ben, ben Space Cast Network has been um, um, ground zero for a number of creative um, kind of syndicates. Um, probably the most well-known um, throughout the world is a collective called Project Blowed, which is an open mic workshop um, established in the mid-1990s that um, you know, I came to learn about as a teenager from older cousins who were serious hip hop heads who pointed me in the direction of saying, if you're looking for the best creative subterranean music that's out there, 
you have to listen to this collective from Los Angeles called Project Blow. Um, ben was one of the founders of, of this collective in the mid-1990s. Um, and in any case, I had always heard about the Space Chaos Network. Um, and it was through this collaboration, the Limerick Park phone company, that I was actually able to begin building a relationship with Ben. Uh, after several kind of conversations and Ben kind of, I'm sure kind of feeling me out, seeing, seeing who I was, um, you know, and us just getting to know one another, Ben reached out to me back in, I guess, goodness, Ben, it was 2017 saying, you know, he has a vast collection of his own archival materials, as well as that of a number of, um, artists, musicians, writers, organizers from LA who have given him material to kind of steward and serve as kind of caretaker. And so Ben was tr trying to strategize, you know, what to do with it, how to, how to build an archive, but as well as an archive that the community had access to. Ben from the forefront said he didn't just want all this material going to the Getty or the Huntington and kind of being in boxes that community members, especially young people, would not be able to have access to. And Ben said, you know, he, he appreciated that people like me, researchers, you know, wanted to go through stuff and, and write about it, but he really wanted to put material in people's hands to remix it, to repurpose it, um, because Ben's own practice in many ways is rooted in kind of the art of remixing, of repressing, of collage. And so he really wanted to figure out ways to that, so that, that the materials would not just kind of sit and, you know, acquire dust, but actually be be used as tools to, to kind of think about the present and cultivate strategies for the future. So in the process of us kind of talking about this, bringing in other advisors to kind of help shape our strategy of fundraising and, and, and also just trying to catalog um, the kind of this abundance of material that you know, Ben has, has access to, we started sitting down and Ben would tell me these kind of incredible stories of his own upbringing, um, of his family members, of the town in which he grew up in Deming, New Mexico. Um, and then he'd start referencing people. And the next thing I know, they'd show up in a space in the middle of one of our discussions and they'd sit down. And next thing I knew, and, and as I said, none of this was planned, you know, we're engaging in a kind of oral history of his peers who are also kind of contributors and members of this kind of extended chaos network community. And at a certain point I said to Ben, I said, would you ever be interested in you know, kind of writing a book, both, you know, about your life. And Ben said, well, I, you know, I'm not really that, that's not really my personality to write a book about me. He said, but if there's a way we can, you know, write a book that uses me as a lens into the experiences, the stories, the creative practices of others, he said, I'd be really up for that. You know, I'd be really up for telling a story about my community and the communities that I've been a part of, um, you know, through this material, through, and through some of the things that I've told you. Um, and that was it's 2017, and we've been embarked on this journey, which, you know, has been in, incredible. Um, you know, I, I can't even, you know, I, I, we talked, we were talking earlier about collaboration, um, you know, and we were talking about the kind of port importance Kevin was talking about, you know, just his excitement about being able to partner with um, this kind of group and collective of dancers. And for me, uh, having been in the kind of academic grind and having felt in many ways kind of constrained by the form of academic writing, academic presentation. You know, my experience with Ben over the last five years has just been liberating. Um, it's been really an experience, you know, that's challenged me to think about storytelling, about history um, in different ways and about how, and how do we communicate, you know, history? What are the different ways we can communicate it, you know, beyond um, the kind of literary form? Um, and what that's culminated in is a book um, called Chaos Theory, the Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell, which is a book of, you know, that really combines um, narrative history with archival materials, um, visual art created by Ben um, and others, um, where in many ways we're relying upon the narrative history, the archival material, and the visual art um, as, as instruments to provide a cultural history about race, art, place, and community, um, where no specific form is privileged over the other, right? So probably the easiest way I've had to kind of describe this at times when we were talking to, you know, editors is it's a mixture of both, you know, kind of narrative history and art catalog, but instead of the kind of images being the material 
that you refer to in the middle of the book or to kind of uh, uh, amplify aspects of the narrative. This narrative is very much reliant on both. Um, you know, in many ways, we try to position the imagery, the archival material as, 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 as modes of storytelling in and of themselves with dynamics of power, um, but that are also very much useful and generative in terms of thinking about, about current day kind of issues of power, inequity, race, gender, um, that we hope that when people look at this archival material, they won't simply be looking at something that refers to the past, but they'll very much see how it still speaks to the present um, in a variety of ways. Um, the history that we cover, you know, goes from 19th century reconstruction, America to present day. And I would actually even say even into the future, um, even into the future. Uh, we call it a migration, a moving narrative history. So it's a, each chapter of the book focuses on a different village. Um, in many ways, Ben grew up in a village, uh, a village that is known as Dimming, which before Dimming was territory occupied, inhabited, cared for by both Apache and before Apache Membres Indians or Native, Native Americans. Um, and so in many ways, what we try to do in the book is use these different villages as entry points to think about um, community formation and the role that creativity plays in community formation in building, you know, new ties of coexistence, but as well as, you know, cultivating spaces for healing. And so the book, as I said, travels from a variety of different villages, from the village of Ben's grandparents to that one which he grew up to the uh, the village where he was stationed as, as, as a young man drafted into the Vietnam War, to the village community that he was part of at UCLA, uh, as part of this now prominent collective of filmmakers known as the LA Rebellion um, Collective of Filmmakers, a group of filmmakers who come out of UCLA in the 1970s, early 1980s, who were making films that really um, challenge the bounds of cinema and really offer nuanced depictions of Black diasporic life, um, to the village that he has been a part of and helped steward in Lamert. Um, one of the things we didn't mention is Lamert Park Village. The it's referred to as the village. So those folks who are based in LA know it as the village. We actually don't even refer it oftentimes as Lamert Park. So the village serves as kind of one of these kind of analytical anchors of of the book. And as I said, we fuse narrative history, archival materials, photos, art, and poetic proverbs to kind of help tell this history. Uh, just a bit of background, so you have some understanding about kind of where we're situating this book. There are a number. There have been a number of important scholarship on LA Black art, art culture, and community. Um, I've just included some of these books here. So Steve Stephen Isoardi's book, The Dark Tree, which looks at which looks at jazz and the community arts in Los Angeles. Um, Daniel Widener's book, Black Arts West, which looks at um, histories of Black community arts formation in Los Angeles from the post-war to the 1980s as well as Kelly Jones' book, South of Pico, which looks at African-American artists in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 1970s. So there's a growing base of you know, scholarship that looks at um, the arts broadly and black arts in Los Angeles. And Ben and the community of artists and media makers that you know, he's been a part of are part of this history. They've been focused on a little bit. One of the key books that has been written about um, kind of LA traditions of, of filmmaking, especially the kind of collective that been as a part of the LA Rebellion film collective. Um, there was an edited work by Jacqueline Stewart, uh, John, Chris, uh, John Christopher uh, Horak, and Allison Nadia Field, which, you know, celebrates the work of LA Rebellion, which relies upon oral histories of the different members um, and has a number of uh, essays where different writers and scholars write about the importance of um, these filmmakers' works. Um, and then two other books, um, The Real Hip Hop, Battling for Knowledge, Power, and Respect in LA, LA Underground, as well as Blowing Up, Rap Dreams in South Central. Both of these works look at that collective I was talking to you about before, Project Blows. So these are both books, um, which in many ways grew out of the scholars' relationships with Ben and them using um, Project Blowed uh, and Chaos Network as kind of ethnographic space to interrogate um, the power of lyricism within hip hop. Um, the various ways that hip hop serves as a site for both community formation, but also as a site of contestation against, you know, practices of state surveillance, leasing, 
um, The Criminalization of Black and Brown Youth. So these are three books, which in many ways look at um, either some of the work that Ben has participated in or some of the, the work that's come out of the spaces that Ben has helped to, 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 to cultivate. Um, I'm gonna flip through all of these. So the book is called, the, you know, Chaos, Chaos Theory, the Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell. This notion of arc um, that we're referring to, in many ways, I mean, it's, you know, playing off of the kind of prominent use of arc. So Noah's Ark, you know, arc symbolizing a vessel or sanctuary that serves as a protection against extinction, right? So in many ways, yeah, the book is an interrogation of the kind of arc that Ben and others have cultivated, you know, um, over the course of their, their lifetimes, right? And this kind of arc referring to forces, belief systems, cultural practices, um, you know, that have helped to, to, to provide them both spaces, um, physical, but also immaterial spaces of sanctuary, possibility, um, you know, alterity. So, you know, operating and existing um, in what is hidden, um, but as well, in our notion of arc, you know, we're also referring to uh, what we might refer to as a kind of blackened sense of arc. So in Los Angeles, and even more broadly beyond Los Angeles, there's kind of black traditions of arc making. Um, and probably the mo most prominent, you know, reference or notion of the arc, A-R-K, is that of um, the musician Sun Ra, uh, jazz musician Sun Ra and his orchestra, right, as well as uh, L.A. musician Horace Tapscott. Um, and it's Pan-African People's Orchestra, where the orchestra refers to, it's a shorthand for Black community-centered practices of performance and improvisation. So when we say arc, we're not just simply referring to kind of Noah's arc, we're also referring to these kind of Black traditions of creative community and creative community serving as a, as a, as a, as a, a space for sustenance um, and a space of sanctuary support um, and solidarity building among especially working class Black people. But the other arc that we're also referring to is ARC arc. So we're, we're pulling off the notion of, yeah, an arc, whether it be in film, you know, um, the kind of resolution um, in narrative or principal theme, uh, Ben, right? So seeing Ben and these various other people we're talking about in the book as part of a kind of continuum of Black creative practices as part of a, 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 a spiral of sorts. Um, but the other arc too kind of comes from the notion of arc as a luminous electoral discharge between two electrodes uh, or other points, right? Um, one of the things we talk about in the book, um, which I won't go into detail here, but hopefully you all will read the book. Ben grew in a town where his grandfather um, had many jobs, but one of his jobs was as a projectionist in two theaters. Um, and so Ben grew up around arc lamps. Arc lamps are a specific component of, of you know, uh, uh, projectors um, that are extremely dangerous, you know, just to kind of generalize uh, how arc lamp works. But in many ways, they're about bringing two kind of electrical charges together to then produce what we see on the screen. Um, and in many ways, this serves as a, a kind of a, a metaphor for the work of Ben and others um, in the village of Lamert Park, but as well as the other villages that we, we historicize in this book, where they serve as sparks of sorts. Um, sparking of new connections between different cultural traditions, um, philosophical approaches, you know, notions of aesthetics, um, but as a spark between people as well. Um, and the necessity of also stewarding, safeguarding, and placekeeping um, these spaces and communities, um, right? As well as the afterlives of these sparks, right? The kind of ghostly presence of these sparks. Together we see this as helping to shape our approach as what we call chaos theory. And this builds off of the kind of scientific theory of chaos theory, right? That, you know, within what appears to be chaotic are underlying patterns um, and systems of repetition, right? So in many ways, we're using this as an entry point to think about this kind of loop, um, this kind of continuum of black creative practices of, of community building, of community safeguarding, of community steward, and the role of improvisation um, within such processes, right? The role of what might appear to others as being chaotic, but which for those within the collective as underlying patterns, as systems of repetition and, and loop making, 
right? So in many ways, this is what we're theorizing within the different um, um, histories that we're offering within this book, right? That this dynamic, disordered, yet interconnected spiraling cycle of patterns of coexistence, healing, and imagination that you can find through both these experiences of these people as well as um, the expressive culture that they fashioned um, over the course of their lives. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna move forward. I might come back to this, but I'll just keep my eye on time. In terms of the archive that we've constructed, we're referring to it as the blues archive, that in many ways, the, the, the history that we explore in this book as well as the creative works and the archival material that we prioritize um, really provide a lens into black sensibilities of endurance, struggle, and meaning making. Um, that this archive can't only be found in kind of documents and ephemera, but must also be found in music, song, and the expressive culture of the people to whom we focus on in the book, but as well as the communities of which they are a part of, right? And what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, their experiences are opaque and mysterious, um, that they're not easily kind of located or transcribed. Um, so Ben, in many ways, described even this book as both history, but also fiction. It's like, how can we really interrogate memory, right? Um, when we know that memory um, comes with its own kind of politics, politics of, of, of power in terms of who are prioritized and positioned within kind of dominant history or histories, um, you know, dominant kind of notions of memory and looking at what are, what are the different kind of, uh, uh, modes of challenging that how, how might how might song offer different kinds of ways of memorializing events that we presume to know um, in many ways the goal in our book is to reconstruct and reconfigure and as well replay and when i say replay it's like playing with the notion of replay like with the you know uh, uh that you might see in i guess a sports game or on, on television how you replay but also with a kind of notion of musicianship right so that in many ways, recognizing that any kind of any kind of mode of you know history or uh, is always something that is interpretive. It's always constructed, so that we we recognize that we're playing to some degree with the history, and, and not saying meaning that in a light kind of a, 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 a man that we don't take this seriously, but more so that in taking different parts and reconfiguring it into something, there's a a kind of creative. Um, modality that's part of that. Um, and so this kind of musicianship, um, we also see as being kind of part, or at least a kind of ethos of musicianship we're seeing as being a part of that, right? Where we're replaying for the sake of centering the past as a tool and weapon for the present and the future. I wanted to, you know, I've been talking over the last couple of minutes, primarily in kind of theoretical abstract terms, but I also wanted, you know, it's really important for us to center this within the kind of materials and the examples and the histories that are part of this book. Ben, I was hoping you could, uh, over the next couple minutes, give us some insight into some of these. These are some of the materials that are part of this book. Ben, can you see this stuff? Yeah, I see it very well. Um, yeah, I, I was hoping you could. So I have a couple images, that, and you've seen. And obviously, you know, you know these images. If you could walk us through some of these images that we see on the screen. Yeah, I'll start at the lower bottom left there. Uh, that's the uh, baseball team uh, that my. Uh, grandfather had, uh, of which I was his bat boy. And these guys toured uh, uh, southern, let's see, I would say uh, Texas, um, all the way up to Colorado, uh, Arizona, and uh, southern, uh, and most of New Mexico. They, uh, they had a, a um, a baseball team that was made up of uh, Native Americans, uh, Little Joe and Big Joe, uh, Black Americans, and Latinos. And it was during the time when, uh, before baseball was integrated. Uh, so he set this up in around the 50s. Uh, I was quite proud of my grandfather for doing that. Also, like, like he was saying, uh, like, uh, Taj was saying, uh, he was also my babysitter, uh, and, and, and part of my babysitting was in the back part of, uh, of the movie theater in the projection booth. 
So I, I got to see that dynamics right firsthand. Uh, the picture above it is, is my hometown biggest, tallest uh, edifice, and it said dimming on it. And it, uh, we were always proud of that, uh, that, that big well because that well brought in uh, the purest water in America, we used to think. And uh, in retrospect, I think that it was a very uh, healthy water place because we had alkali water there. And the person to the uh, to your left of it is my wife, my first wife, uh, Pam. And um, the person next to them uh, on the top is my brother, Richard, who just passed last week. So that's an interesting image. And that's my baby mama next to him, to the right. And, uh, and then two of my youngest brothers, of eight brothers and one sister. Uh, the pitch, picture to the right is of the four big ones, as we were called. Uh, I was the oldest. My brother, Harold, who also has passed, is the other person, and then uh, the twins. Um, uh, Harold also had a twin who passed away. So uh, that would have been a picture of five. <laughs> but this was William and then Lucinda are the fraternal twins. Benny at the top. And yeah, as you can see, I have nice little cherry cheeks. <laughs> yeah, for those who don't was, know, you see Benny at the top, that's, that's, that's Ben. Ben as a child was, I mean, throughout, up until his 20s was known as Benny Caldwell. Not ben Caldwell. Yes. And um, yeah, and so this is us. And these pictures, which this is an interesting thing. When you go from being uh, like a high school kid uh, at 18 and then 19, 20, 21 or so was my time growing up in this place called Vietnam. The thing that I found that was quite unique about Vietnam to me was that just that picture that you see down below there, the innocence and wonderment of the children, uh, how they, uh, they saw through us. And so I had a real alignment with the innocence and the wonderfulness of the people that were the young kids there. And I saw them as my protector, not me as their protector. Uh, and, um, it was uh, uh, my first use of the camera. Uh, I started shooting with a uh, with those uh, 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 Kodak brownies uh, that you could just buy at, at the uh, military post. And because I had been in a movie theater as a kid, I was really impressed at how war for real looked totally different in. Uh, than what it did in the movies. So that's the reason I pulled out my camera. Uh, this is one of the first images that I did when I uh, got out of the army. And um, it, uh, it really harkens back to what you do in a place like New Mexico, uh, when uh, before there was, a, uh, there, it wasn't, it's like a farming community. So there wasn't that much light. So in the middle of the night or even during the days with the cloud movements, you could just lay down and a person like me would just lie down and uh, just go into space because there's nothing between you and space except uh, air <laughs> in New Mexico. So sometimes it really makes you feel like you're flying through space. So I, uh, one of the first self portraits that I did uh, at uh, going to Phoenix College, um, I did that picture and it sent me off on the idea that I was an artist in, in, with still photography to my, to my still photography teachers. They thought that this, all of this was shot within the camera. It's a, it's a, it's a probably 
uh, a threefold shot because uh, that that uh, that wheel isn't obviously running across me, and um, and then the sky is also the desert. So those were just an interesting way to look at. Uh, that was my first cosmic touch filmically with film. Right. So this is a double exposure. And you took this picture in the Salt River, which is a river that runs through Phoenix, right? Um, right. Salt River bed. The Salt River bed. So it was an empty river bed that, that you laid in. And, and to some degree, you kind of created this picture where it's almost like you are have sunken into the sand or you are part of the soil of sorts. Yeah. Part of the soil and also of the sky, the and kind the of sky. two things that are important there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you could see that it was really a river because it has, you know, every once in a while, when the water goes through there, it goes pretty uh, fast, uh, but it's not often. It is dry. Right. Which is a strong indicator of what the Southwest is like to me. Um, now, this series, I called it the awakening because I... Uh, started seeing more than what was there. Uh, and I started operating with that. And also at the same time, I was, uh, I was working for a shoe company and they had this phenomenal set of dyes. So that coloring that you see on there is all hand done. Um, and I used uh, solarization, which is a, a method of reversing your image uh, in places. So I use that as a methodology for, for bouncing off my colors. And this whole series of Amka was the series that got me my full ride to UCLA. Uh, they, they liked the photographs. They thought, one of the things uh, for you guys who are wanting, well, back in the days when they were choosing people for film school, they preferred to have people who were in disciplines other than film as a part of, uh, of choosing them at UCLA. And, and so I was grabbed by the school because of my use of still photography and then to see how those applications could apply to film, to movie, moving films since I was working on one picture at a time. Now, and, I, I yeah, and that's what AMCA means, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Amka, yeah. Did someone say that? Um, yeah, Amka means awakening in Swahili. It means awakening. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then, go ahead. No, go for it, Ben. No, go. I, I was going to say I was yeah, going to post for people in the chat a link to this film if they wanted to view it later. Yeah. Now this is the end of this film that I made called um, Medea. I fell in love with the name Medea because it wasn't a word that I heard until I was in college. And I thought it was an interesting hyphenated word meaning mother deer. Uh, so I then made this one as a way to kind of, uh, the film is a way to uh, yeah, exercise all the negative aspects of, of what has happened in our culture uh, and have the child in utero contextualize them so they can come back and handle the white world like this young kid did with the balloon. And that's the basic element. It was a, 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 a note on my filmmaking, because I was raised in the back part of a movie theater, can you imagine seeing a movie back in those days, if you had, um, let's see, uh, Psycho, when it came with, uh, with, uh, Hank, uh, with what's his name, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. I remember seeing the trailers for almost a month before the movie came. And that was with every movie that was shown. So you would see that. And then by the time the movie came, if it was a hit, it, was play it played for two months, three months. And it would play over and over and over and over. I got tired, so tired of talking heads. So 
the way that I started working with films is in a way that um, I call picture writing. It was like hieroglyphics. It was, you write with pictures instead of having the words guide you through totally. I, I thought, why, why say things twice? Uh, you show them pictorially, then you have to say, I am about to walk across the street. You know, so you're showing them that. So why do you have to say that? So those are the ways that we started. I started working with my film and and those are the way and that kind of conjuring and challenging and rituals seem like the most important way to do it, because it seems like the other art forms that migrated uh, it migrated into uh, that those 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 systems migrated into them such as theater done by black Americans, the music done by us, and almost everything, uh, church. Uh, you can, with the church, you can see it's uh, imbued with the same kind of challenging, ch channeling and ritual and, re, uh, and, and locking into uh, this thing that we call, um, um, uh, what is it? Uh, tying into, nature very strongly i'm going to go through this slide i'm not going to spend too much time with it what i do want to highlight about the film of dia um, as ben points out in terms of the various ways that these kind of other black traditions of performance storytelling um, migrated into other forms and genres you know part of what's important about ben's approach to filmmaking um is that in many ways he did not, and he and his peers did not abide by the kind of conventions of, of the time period. They were very invested in cultivating unique um, modes of visual representation um, that challenged, you know, what cinema could be and how people could experience cinema. So for Ben, you know, his approach to filming, film editing um, was very much shaped by um, spoken word poetry. And especially the kind of black radical spoken word poetry of the late 1960s, early 1970s, as well as the kind of writings of um, post-colonial um, African writers like Wole Soyinka, um, uh, Chino Achebe, um, as well by radical approaches to black music, especially that of bebop, um, freeform jazz, musicianship, funk. Um, so in many ways, his approach to filmmaking um, if you watch his films too, I, I'm sure for for some it might challenge um, what you how you expect a film to be presented because in many ways the rhythm of his approach to filmmaking is very much centered in practices that do not approach it um, in the kinds of ways that have been privileged. Um, and as I point out here, in many ways it builds off this idea of collective improvisation, right? That in many ways these kind of approaches to, to a collective improvisation are were, were approaches that were kind of silenced um, and quelled um, by the European colonial encounter um, and empire. And that chaos is not something to be run away from. It's some, but the chaos in many ways, this kind of notion of collective improvisation um, is a means of kind of collective um, communion and interaction. Uh, I'm going to move forward, Ben, just for the sake of time. Ben's second film is a film called I and I, um, which is uh, an incredible work, uh, which fuses a kind of documentary approach with um, an experimental approach, um, with also um, narrative storytelling. So it's kind of three different modes within one film. Um, and I also just highlight here, these are some of the different collectives, formations, and works that we uh, focus on in the book. So we obviously focus on the kind of period prior to Ben's upbringing, that of his family members, his own, his time in, in Vietnam, but as well as the, the, the period uh, uh, when, he, when which he really kind of comes into filmmaking, the LA Rebellion film period, and then into um, the period after um, with the work, the multimedia work, the multimedia performance work that he's doing um, at Chaos Network. And here just a couple different representations of it. Um, I Fresh is a hip hop collective in the 1980s. Holly Watts is a collective that's shaped by Ben and various others. I don't know if you all know who Roger Guinevere Smith, a very important um, actor, um, gained a lot of attention from his work in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, but he's probably become far more well-known because of his one-man performance shows 
where he's played you know, a variety of actors, including Rodney King and especially Huey P. Newton. Uh, ben talked earlier about his work as part of Electronic Cafe, this kind of early version of what we're doing right now. Um, that was part of the 1984 LA Olympics, this collaboration with a number of really important technologists, uh, Sherry Rabinowitz, Kit Galloway, um, and then into the 1990s with Project Load and Lamert Park Phone Company. We're just gonna close out with a few examples of the more recent uh, um, kind of innovations that Ben and the community of artists, technologists that he's a part of have helped to shape. So this is actually one called Bench Beat. Ben, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the Bench Beats? Yeah, well, uh, as we were thinking out the movement of the cars and moving throughout the community and also the idea of how the community um, uh, could be engaged. So we thought it would be interesting if we could learn how we could play the city. In other words, we thought of the idea of playing the city. And so while you're waiting for the, um, for our vehicle to come and get you, we thought it would really be interesting to engage the bench uh, next to them. So we put this thing together and it's called Beat Bench. Uh, and uh, the phone next to it is the phone that we use to hack, uh, hack uh, the projects too. So those were the two things. And then the third thing that we helped now create is the autonomous vehicle, which we're now funded to do that. To me, it will be full circle because uh, we'll be ready for 2020, 2028 Olympics. And I started in this town with the teleconferencing and now we're going to by 2028 to have these autonomous vehicles using AR and VR and all the new uh, methods that I learned in 1984. Ben, you're going too fast. Going too fast? I, okay. I, want, I wanted to show them the, 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 the bench beat. So, so basically this beat bench, I mean, so the other thing I think, Ben, that you didn't mention that's important too is, and this is in a lot of places, especially cities like LA. In LA, especially since the 1990s, the, the, there has been an effort to design LA in ways um, that are not in the interest of some of our most important populations, some of our most dispossessed populations, our houseless populations, right? So yeah, you've seen in LA and various other cities, the ways that like, Bus stops and bus stops, you know, really serve as a space where the houseless oftentimes, you know, will sleep. You've seen benches that have been designed like you see over here on the left hand side um, to prevent people from sleeping on benches, from occupying benches, right? Um, ways that do not acknowledge the humanity um, and the necessity of, of finding, you know, safe spaces to rest for those who do not have um, housing. Um, and so this notion of creating a beat bench, the, I, the idea was how do we turn this space that people occupy on a daily basis, you know, and maybe with no interaction with the people who are sitting right next to them or standing next to them, how do we you know, create a space where they can interact through sound, through music, through creativity? Good, man. One more time. Right, so the that idea was, really, was, I mean, you say, who is that? Yeah, that was real hip because he was just came from getting a Grammy. <laughs> he said he just came from getting a Grammy, right? So the idea uh, is like, how do you take a beat making machine and take that away from the kind of private space of one's studio or one's home and make that part of public design, right? Um, and what's great about the beat bench is obviously, you know, people who make beats, they're intrigued by it. But it's also something that's fairly interactive and easy to use. So for instance, my children, one of their favorite things to climb on when they go to Ben's space is the beat bench. And they sit there, I mean, for me, which is fantastic, for a half hour to an hour. And they're fascinated with just trying to cultivate rhythms with, you know, what they're sitting on. So it allows us to imagine, you know, this bench, this kind of, that we presume to have a particular kind of function to imagine it in other kinds of ways is offering different kinds of possibilities and as an interactive tool. Um, this other example I'll point to is we were talking about the Lemert Park Phone Company. Um, so Lemert Park Phone Company just actually a month before the start of the global pandemic partnered with an organization called Trap Heels um, to create 
an activation um, to draw awareness to the experiences, the struggles of people on death row um, and their families, right? So it was an activation where in the middle of, you know, South Central LA, people could come to look at artwork created to honor the lives and experiences of people in the death row, but as well as once you picked up a payphone, you could hear the stories from these people, you know, in their own voices of people who were on death row, many of them um, unjustly, but as well as not only hear their own personal kind of uh, testimonials, but also hear testimonials from their parents, their siblings, their children about the impact of mass incarceration on their lives, right? So this is just another kind of, you know, example of the various ways that the technology um, and the creative practices that Ben and others have been a part of are, are, are also focused on, you know, drawing awareness to systemic inequities, um, historical inequalities and injustice. The last yep. example will show, I'm gonna stop my share. Yeah, I was gonna say also Benjamin, who's one of our, uh, one of our uh, professors who's now, he's not a, he wasn't a professor when he was first working with us. He's, uh, he was a part of our team and he's now presently teaching at American U. And we have eight of those phone booths as a part of uh, remembering the history of Anacostia because it was getting overlooked so uh the phone boots were used as a, a kind of like a story core saving device of stories All right within the smithsonian the smithsonian museum of anacostia so i we actually you know what with the other film what with just seeing how much time we've used it probably would be better to kind of open up for um discussion right. questions comments but you know we, first off again and we were all for taking some time out of your day to to, to be here with, with us and to, to listen to us share this, this project we've been working on. Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you so much for sharing and all these kind of take me back to the good old days of Los Angeles, but also so many things, uh, histories, art that I didn't really know, <laughs> although I was there for six years. And also the way in which, you know, Ben's personal history uh, interwoven with all this kind of important uh, historical, uh, sh uh, you know, history changing uh, moments and also always at, at the forefront of these technological changes <laughs> and, 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 and art is amazing. I mean, like talking about teleconference in 1984, right? and we're today on Zoom, it's really, uh, really very futuristic and, and, and also connecting to, you know, um, autonomous vehicles and AI at the moment. I, I, I'm, I'm sure the audience have a lot of questions to ask about, you know, Ben's amazing artwork um, and also Tash's uh, fantastic curation of, of everything. So I see many hands. So from my end, the first uh, is Chen Chenda. Chenda is actually uh, allowed me to, she, she, she's uh, my uh, 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 colleague um, at the physics department, but she's also a uh, I, I don't know if you Tash and uh, Ben knows her. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, a critical, definitely. critical race definitely. scholar and the feminist I, 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 and uh, wrote this amazing book. Yeah. I have your book. Yeah, I have your book sitting right on my desk. Oh yeah. my goodness, it's such an honor to have you with. It. What an incredible work. Yeah. So and go ahead, Chad. Thank you, thank you, Lynn, for for introducing me. I'm. Mm -hmm. This was like really amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn, for for hosting this as well, and thank you all for taking the time to talk to our community about about this important work. Um, you know, it's it's interesting for for me as someone from Los Angeles, um, who I I did I uh, grades one through seven uh, at Thirty Second Street, right across the street from USC, and um, and spent a lot of time traversing the geography from East LA, which is where I was born and raised, to um, other parts of LA. I ran for the Jets in LA, so I knew that community, but it's not, it's also not where I was born and where I grew up. And so I was sitting here thinking about, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about how you see kind of geography shaping the different way these movements move through Los Angeles and um you know how your work Ben is in conversation with um 
say the scenes that I'm thinking about like Sashu Foster's literary work about East LA and I'm curious about how you see that dialogue traversing the different trajectories and um, and, and geographies of, of the communities in Los Angeles, especially as they've demographically shifted. Um, and I don't just mean gentrification, but also gentrification. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when I first started the project with, um, uh, with the teleconferencing, that was part of the things that we were working with is breaking down those demographic, uh, like the freeways, the mountains, all the natural obstacles that stop people from intercommunicating. Uh, so we, that was what was unique to us about the use of teleconferencing because we could one, break down those borders. And then secondly, uh, part of what I did with my students uh, uh, as I started developing this is we used it as a, as a way to sh a physic well, the, the humanization of the technology. We first tried to do it by first people uh, writing down their interpretations of each of these places that they've heard through media. So that's the scriptedness of the community. So we wanted them to first look at the script of the community. And then so if you're going to be in Hollywood, write down all those words that you think, uh, uh, what is Hollywood like? Uh, East LA, write down what you think that's like. Downtown Los Angeles, what is that like? Uh, Latinos, uh, I mean, Asian community uh, that's downtown, what is that like? So that's what we would do. And then I would get in the bus, take my students around and show the difference between the physical reality of what how the community lives and are interacting with each other. And, uh, and in fact, what is written about them or media is telling about them. So those are the two ways that I started trying to break down that. And then the, the real way that I started really thinking it out is from my kind of New Mexico culture is to look through not just the black eyes, but through the Native American eyes. Uh, so the way that I do that is by looking in the four directions. And so the four directions is how I put everything together because then that's the way that the natives see us. Uh, they see us all as one family and that all the families have different focuses and health and wellness to help this overall pie of humanity happen. So that's the template that I basically use to break down all of that division stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So next on my list here is Kevin. Kevin, you want to ask? Hi, Ben Hi. and Taj. Such a great um, presentation. You've given me a lot to read and, and watch and my students too. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask a question as a digital media scholar. So, and it, and it came from Ben when you were showing the piece that was, I think, uh, AMCA. And it was like a solarized and then hand edited couple of uh, photographs. And yeah. I mean, first of all, it reminded me of the cover art for the Miles Davis album, uh, Bitches Brew, so I, which I have to imagine is not entirely coincidental. But that's not my question. My question was going to be, um, I was, I was, I was thinking, um, solarization, something that took you hours to do, now you can do in Photoshop, like with a few clicks. And I know that this is something that you both think about with the, the Chaos Network, because from what I understand, just briefly reading about it, um, you are focusing on teaching young people how to use digital technologies. So, so in your mind, what, what does does the new sort of palette of digital media afford to artists, especially young artists? What, what does it open up? But also like, you're also sort of reaching back by, by keeping the analog present, you know, the telephone. And in my mind, that's like, you're not just hacking, you use the word hacking, Taj, like you're not just hacking the phone, you're actually hacking digital culture by insisting that we keep something that's analog and in keeping the improvisational part which to me is like very flesh and blood analog. So how, how do you think about, you know, what, what's made possible by the digital, but also what you still, why you still want to keep the analog? <laughs> well, I think we're going to find, I mean, we're finding out like uh, uh, analog is 
uh, is real. It's like a physical object. So uh, I think that that's the first thing. Uh, like last night I was transferred, I shot with my still camera, uh, my proof sheets. And those proof sheets hold up better than a digital shot. Because I can blow it up to whatever height with that I want and it still doesn't fall apart. Digital does. That's the first thing. Uh, this, the other thing I was describing to my daughter about spot, uh, uh, spot development with your hands. I don't know if you, there, there's no mechanical, the digital can't do that. It can't make the warm, uh, bring out the real areas that are shadowed. I can bring those out or, bring, or, or, or bust it down. And then also with solarization, I could isolate with a paintbrush any specific place that I wanted to put hypro. And that hypo would, would freeze it in the whiteness that I needed and then bust out everything else around it. Whereas if you do it digitally, it busts out the whole thing. And it, it, so that's the major difference is I, I like the way you can isolate and work within. I love the digital world. I think that it's fast, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and it's over, but it doesn't necessarily hold with the quality that you can do with hand development. But ben, can I ask and I think follow that follows through with everything else too. I <clears throat> can I ask you a follow-up though, based off of that? So yes, I know you, 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 there is something that you still find in terms of the kind of tangibility and the and the craftsmanship in terms of the the, the analog. But I also know that you know you're you, you're you're not closed off in terms of ac accessing and making use of kind of new platforms. So. You know, like you were one of the first people I knew when TikTok came out to be making TikTok videos. Um, and I, I was wondering if you can talk about like why, even with your investment in the analog, you still try to remain as inquisitive and curious about playing with the new platforms, new modes of creative expression that emerge. Well, I, I think he hit on something there when he said Miles Davis. I think I learned a lot from Miles in his application of using blues and then making that electronic, you know, uh, I, I, those are those are kind of similar metaphors that I use for my artwork too. Is I really look at the jazz musicians a lot, and then I also look at the blues musicians a lot when I talk about utilizing my art. Uh, so I was raised around guys in the blues, like let's say when there was no instrument, when the the brooms that we had back in those days had wires around them. They would unwire that, use a nail, and hammer that in the porch, and then put the other one on the side of the wall. And then you have an upright base, right? So they could then boom, 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 and then talk and do, tell those kind of crazy blues stories that were, were I, and it's so that, uh, if you're gonna use anything to understand why I use all those things, it's similar to how we had to, I go back to, to that as a metaphor on us creating by any means necessary in a place where we were forced to even not have an instrument. You know, we were in a work camp where they said, you just work, we, you know, you can't do anything else. So we created a whole lot of things around it. So that also informed the beat pitch because, you know, uh, we're thinking of making that like the, uh, like a cajon, uh, which was the first instrument that we played on, on uh, uh, along the uh, the ports in the Mississippi and and the ports in uh, in Cuba, the ports in in um, in Brazil. So there is that thread that follows through with all the ways that we've ended up having to create in this kind of prison that we're in. And so I use that as a crossover into all my art form with, with, and so I use that as a means to create by any means necessary. So I've been able to do a lot of movies without Hollywood in Hollywood. And that's what the, that was why we were called rebellious because we, we, we could figure out how to get our work still done. And so that's the real metaphor behind my work is 
uh, to make the work and to not stop uh, the creativity that's in us just because we're imprisoned. Great. Thank you so much. I think we we have about five minutes left and we still have two uh, people uh, want to ask questions. So first is uh, Michael Jackson. He's also, oh, we actually have three, two, uh, oh, three, three more. Maybe what we could do is we could go around the room to collect all the questions and Ben and Tash could answer them. Uh, so um, Michael, would you like to go first to ask your question? Yeah, yes, and I'll try to go quickly. First of all, this is just fantastic. Uh, what, what an amazing archive and handling of these mixed forms. And the, uh, I'm just curious about the, the beat bench, the one on the left, the, the, the green one. Is that pitched or do you, have you ever, um, I, I thought that might just be the kind of park bench that you were uh, riffing off, but I also wondered if it could have been pitched and the some of the, the linguistic messages like, do not lie here and we can make you talk. I, I just I just <laughs> found these quick messages so productive and uh, po polysemous. Yeah, that, that one for not sitting here, we worked against that idea. How can we make it where people will feel comfortable but not so comfortable that they'll make it their house? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those were the kinds of things that we're working on still because uh, 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 what does that mean and how can we make the community something that's an upgrade beauty for the neighborhood but not get destroyed and still get engaged but get uh, protected. And so th that, that's the type of stuff that we're working on between now and 2020, 2026 and 2028 as a, uh, as a longitudinal study. I look forward to this. Yeah. So we have three students actually from my uh, media studies and global digital capitalism classes raising their hand. Uh, so Colleen, Drew, Lauren, would you like to speak out your question? And then uh, Ben and Tash uh, maybe could, after you all finish your question and Ben and Tash could answer your question. So Colleen, you go ahead. Uh, Drew, yeah, go ahead, Drew. Okay, so I was just wondering if you guys were planning on spreading this like kind of movement across the world and kind of going maybe somewhere in Europe and seeing like what the difference with the interactions of maybe like the bench or something else to, to kind of contrast the differences in that. Yeah, and Colleen? Um, my question was just um, why did the um, art piece of like AMCA have such an impact on UCLA and like what the significance of, of it was. That's what I was like interested in. Mm -hmm. And then Lauren. Um, so, so when you talked a lot about the village communities that you grew up in, I just wanted to ask what kind of feedback you got from those people in the village, in the villages like that you lived in and that your grandfather lived in like after uh, the work that you've done. Great. <laughs> Uh, I've been to the first ones about uh, beat bench, but also your work, taking your works when you've taken them into other places, spaces and places. Yeah, well, uh, we took this, uh, this straight to Denmark almost uh, the first, second year. Uh, we, uh, me and Francois and Carl and Benjamin. And we made our presentation there. The thing that made our project quite unique than almost all the studies that were being done at that time, because that was an international gathering of, of activists in media, uh, that we were the only ones that had a participant of, in the study that was there. And it happened to be me. Because I, was, I represented the community that was being studied and I was a professor within it. So it was an interesting thing that I think the whole group discovered was that they didn't have participants describing what their study that would, they were the, they were the studies, the, what would you call it? They were the, 
the, the, the, uh, there was always the, always the, it was always the, the expert was always the one who doing the studying as opposed to the people who had been studied. Yes, <laughs> kind of similar to what he and I are doing now because I'm a participant in and normally it's only just uh, Taj just describing this as opposed right. to me and Taj. And right. so that was what was quite unique about our uh, all of the conferences that I've been in. And I've been in them in Canada. Uh, we also went to Italy. So I've been around Europe with these. Uh, I think that it's a, a, a real good place, but I've also been in Africa and Cuba uh, with this. Uh, and so we're building it out in, in those types of ways. But I'm not interested in it being viral. I want it to kind of grow naturally within the, I don't want to force it onto cultures. I want it to grow out of cultures. Uh, and I, I'm more interested in the, uh, of it, like planting a seed and watching the tree grow to all the steps. And I don't want the, the, the tree to jump steps. I want it to take the full elements of what it takes in order for it to grow into a nice, healthy, nutritious idea within what we're doing. So, th so we're taking it slow, but real and, uh, and enjoying the process. Uh, how does my community deal with it from place to place? Let's see, New Mexico. Um, I was always ex I, I, I was always an interesting young man in those worlds is because it seemed like every place that I went, everybody saw me as almost a watcher, a, a, a viewer, a, um, a storyteller, the griot. The, the, the holder of the stories of, of people. So uh, that's the way uh, uh, people have treated me in all these various villages that I've been in. Uh, uh, and I'm a real per people's person. I like people in all the different ways they show themselves. And I, and I, I don't care, people might see them as toxic, but then I would say, oh, that's an interesting toxic person there. You know, I don't say he should be another way or another, I like the way that people turn out to be and it's quite unique. So that's the way that I deal with differences. Got it. And why? Do and you I think, think it's definitely a New Mexico way too. Why do you think UCLA, um, I think Colleen asked, why do you think UCLA was receptive to your AMCA series? Um, especially that being a work of kind of multimedia photography and then getting into a cinema program with that. Yeah, I think what they liked about it, well, what I heard about it was uh, the perception of painting with light. Because uh, my, my pictures kind of showed a different kind of perception of how color and light uh, dealt with and the, and the school liked that perspective. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. That's amazing uh, sh uh, sharing experience. And I, I learned so much from it. I know Tash has a keynote to deliver <laughs> in a few hours. So uh, we will let uh, Tash and Ben go. But uh, thank you so much. It's such an honor and pleasure for us to have you here. And uh, we are so looking forward to your book in 2023, next year, right? Um, and and I, will, I will also... Um, uh, put the recording uh, on YouTube. Hope to generate more conversation <laughs> on the internet community. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank so you for having us. Yeah. Uh, as I said, really, thank really you everyone happy for to be with you all. And, and Shonda, Disordered Cosmos, as I said, has been like my favorite book over the last two months. So I'm very excited to, to ha have you, you know, at, our, at this talk. This is great. Thank you so much, Lynn, for coordinating this. This is great. Thank you, Tash Ben, for coming. And <laughs> thank you guys a whole lot. And this is our first talk, so this has been fun. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Right, take care.